we've been in the process of some incredible um, investigation and research trying to ensure that we have the right partner to uh, play our part in what we're all facing in this global pandemic. And I am so excited to give you the details of this exciting gift we get to give. One million dollars we are gonna give to Convoy of Hope. That is a, a tie, the 10% of their vision to give 10 million meals away. Way more important than the million dollars is the million meals that we get to supply as a community because of your faith. In fact, next week, a semi-truck is gonna pull up and we're gonna begin the dispersion of supplies and resources and, and meals and food. And Jesus, I just um, pray right now that you remind her how loved she is, how taken care of she is, how protected she is, and how safe she is, God. You know, the, the bag of groceries is to me the physical need, but our, my desire really is that every single person in every car really feels fully seen, that they are validated, that they realize that they're not invisible, because I think with all the things that are going on, it's really easy to feel like you're not seen and you're forgotten. So I'm hoping that even a smile over the top of a medical mask with their people's eyes and at someone asking their name makes people realize again that they are fully seen and fully loved by God and by us, Church Home. Thank you so much, Church Home. Thank you personally to you specifically. Thank you for your faith, your trust. We were made for difficult days just like this. And it is because of your lean in and your trust and your passion and your faith that we can do what we're doing and we're going to continue to do it together. Church home. Happy Sunday. We've, we have, it's been, we've had another amazing week. I was going to say we've made it another week, but that sounds kind of uh, pessimistic. To be so. honest, I kind of feel like we made it another day. Yeah, that's a good thing. That's so, true. Hey, we, we made it a week and a day. It's <laughs> so much time. You okay there? Yeah. Sorry, I'm just good. adjusting. Yeah. <laughs> hey, happy Sunday. We're so glad you're here. I love that video so much. Oh my Seeing gosh. the images of people receiving meals so and food. Good. And yeah, and just that thought that we're oh not just God. trying to hand people food. You can get food anywhere, but your face can be seen. And we get to meet natural needs and spiritual needs. And it's so fun to be a part of a community that's doing all of that. And I know it's a, it's a weird world right now. We can't see so much of what is happening. So to be able to have a glimpse into there and seeing it is really, is really cool. By the way, welcome yes. to church. This is Church Home. My name is Chelsea. This is my husband, Judah. Um, I together. say we've We're been married for 20 years. He's been going lately with Feels like, like 220 if you're asking me. And that's, I'm kidding. <laughs> that's quarantine life right there, folks. But uh, we, we do love each other. straight days in the same bed. This is the first time in our entire marriage. Yeah. We've been 47 straight Not days marriage, in the same bed. But, really? Um, yeah, yeah. Since, oh. since, like when the kids were little. We spent 47 straight days yeah. in the bed. We did. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. I mean, like we went to bed in the same bed every night. Wow, we've really gotten detailed We've here. Really I apologize. Here. We have other things to I talk about. I apologize. Those <laughs> okay. are good things to I talk will about. apologize for what you say. It works a lot better that we way. We should do marriage counseling at the beginning of every <laughs> sermon. Oh, I think we do. <laughs> That's right, we do. Uh, but I was trying to say, like, we, we do love each other, but we also love church <laughs> and church home. And for us, this isn't a place for us to just get on a video camera and talk because there are other things we could do with our lives. But uh, we love that we get to build a sense of community around Lord. content based on Jesus. Oh, and word. if this is a new or a newer experience to you, first of all, welcome. I know it takes so much courage uh, um, to even try something new. I Whatever agree. way you're experiencing this, you're, maybe you've not been to church before and you're realizing now this is church and you're kind of bracing yourself for bad news or to have something shoved down your throat. Can I just encourage you, you can relax right now in this moment. You're going to get good news and you're really going to hear, you're going to find out really fast that to Judah and I, this is not a religion. This isn't a set of rules that we are following to try to impress a God who is far up in the sky. The truth is we have met a person named Jesus and he is so real to us that he has shaped every detail of our lives. But if you have not met Jesus the way we have, that is okay. You still belong here. And we, we really do believe that you're still gonna be encouraged in these next moments. So you can breathe right now and totally. it's gonna be okay. And if you wanna get more involved here in our community, about three years ago, we renamed named our church Church Home because of the vision and where we were headed. Church like a home and then church in your home. Church at home, which we had no idea it would be mandated globally. Yeah. But if you want to be a host, you may not know this, but there are church at home hosts actually now all over the world, not exaggerating. And so if you want to become a host 
And of course, that just simply looks like in inviting maybe those in your neighborhood or your friends or coworkers. For some, that's not possible at this point. It's just family. But in the future, we hope that there'll be many more hosts. Yeah, and, and we really are preparing right now. Uh, right now, a lot of the church at home expression is over Zoom calls. But as some states yeah. and places are beginning to open up, we're realizing, hey, we're not going to be able to go to big buildings. It's not our, it's like the last step of what any reopening is going to be. But we will be able to go to each other's homes pretty soon. Yep. And so if you are interested in preparing for that and helping us, there's lots of information somewhere on the website. You can go to churchhome.org and find it. You literally have only, there's, there's a green box that we're supposed to stand in. Chelsea has literally pushed me to the very corner of the green box. Welcome to our marriage. Are, are we doing Welcome this now? Welcome to our marriage. I'm kidding. It's not a, it's not a depiction it's, of our marriage. because I like Esther so much. Hey, <laughs> but I'm about to leave, but just to let you know it's going to happen Fox, in these barely. next moments, I'm going to leave. Judah has a message that is really encouraging and inspiring. You liked it at yeah, the 9 a.m.? Yeah, I heard it at the 9. It was really great. She I'm barely actually complimented me. Re- I complimented you three times. Oh, you I'm did? sorry it wasn't oh, okay. good enough. I said great, and he said it's better than great. I'm like, I sorry, did not. I yes, I, exactly. No, you were like, it's great. I'm like, I thought it was better than that. Nope. So that was exactly what happened. I'm going to leave. He's going to preach a great message, a Thanks, better man. than great message. Thanks. And then after that, I'm going to come back up. We're going to have a few community moments together that we really love. And then after that, we're going to have a time of singing and worship. And I really know those singing moments are so special. It's, so it's like so often we hear things with our head that we really need to get into our heart. And there's something about those moments of singing that it just gets us into our heart. So I'm going to leave and it's going to be better than great. Okay. All right. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Got the whole green box to myself now. I'm kidding. Um, I want to talk to us today about why I think you're sad. Why I think you're sad. This started uh, on last, uh, two Sundays ago, actually, I think. Um, They're all kind of just coming together, (laughs) which is Wednesday, which is Sunday. Uh, But I am preaching, for those that don't know, if you want to tune in, I'm preaching a new sermon every Wednesday and then another new sermon every Sunday. Um, wasn't planning on doing a series of talks and sermons, but uh, we are now. And it's kind of like what I think or why I think you're frustrated. Why I think you're tired was Wednesday. And today I want to talk to you why I think you're sad. Why I think you might be experiencing some sadness in your heart and your soul. I'll explain I want to remind you before we get started, this is not going to be a sad sermon. Even though it's a sermon about you being sad, it's not going to be a sad sermon, and it's going to end with good news. I want to read Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 1. Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 1 says this, Now faith is the substance or the assurance of things hoped for. It's the evidence or the conviction of things not seen. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. Four. I want to draw your attention to the word faith and the word hope. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Now let's rewind and go back a couple thousand years, actually way more than 2,000 years, multiple thousands of years, and let's listen to one of the wisest men who ever lived, ancient King Solomon, and he penned these words. Proverbs chapter 13 and verse 12, hope deferred, delayed, makes the heart sick, he said. Interesting observation of the human condition. Solomon inspired by God to write this phrase down. When your hope is delayed or deferred, it makes your heart sick or sad, right? Suddenly you start to feel like, I was really hoping that would happen. I was really hoping my dreams, my wishes, my desires, my aspirations would happen. They're delayed, they're, they're, they're deferred, and it makes for a sick soul, Solomon said. The sermon again is titled, Why I Think You're Sad. Will you join me in prayer? God, thank you for the minutes and moments we share. We ask that, God, you would take this ordinary talk and sermon and you would turn it in to an encounter with you. We thank you for your grace. Lord, thank you for live golf that is happening in like an hour. I am so grateful for live golf today and help Ricky Fowler win. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, Live sports today, folks. Even if you're not a golf fan, it's still live sports. And it's for charity, and I am pumped. And yes, my TV is recording it, so don't tell me who wins, but I'm I'm pretty excited. Have you ever experienced hope deferred? I mean, I think the answer is 
Obviously, yes. If you've been living more than 22 minutes on earth, you have experienced a dream, a desire, a wish, a hope, an aspiration that just doesn't seem to be happening or coming to pass. Something you really got your hopes up for. You ever heard that statement? I got my hopes up, man. I got my hopes up. I'm, I'm hoping against hope. I'm going to believe this is going to happen. It's going to be incredible. Or, or maybe you started 2020 out like most of us. Remember that? Remember the beginning of this year? Anybody remember the beginning of this year when we were like 2020? It's going to be a year of 2020 vision, right? It's going to be a year of total clarity. And what we meant to say was a year of COVID, not clarity, right? It's, it's, it's kind of a year so far. If you've seen all the memes online, it's like 2020 so far, and it's like something just really discouraging. It has been a challenging year, to say the very least, an unprecedented season and year, frankly, in human history. You could sum up COVID-19 with hope deferred, dreams delayed, wishes denied, right? It's just like everything we were hoping for seems to be slipping through our grasp. Have you ever experienced hope deferred? I want to start today by telling you a story. It's a story found in Luke chapter 24. You can read it for yourself later, but let me tell it to you. It goes something like this. There were two disciples. We know one of them was named Cleopas. We'll call him Cleo. Cleo and his buddy are on a road approximately seven miles outside of ancient Jerusalem. Now, what has just happened it's quite frankly the most significant moment in human history. Three days before, according to Luke chapter 24, Jesus, the leading candidate for Messiah, the prophesied Jewish Messiah, the champion of the ages that the Torah and the Old Testament prophesied, many believed had arrived. He was crucified between two criminals in a place called Golgotha, and he had been buried in a rich man's tomb. By the time we get to our story, the camera opens and we see Cleo and his unnamed friend, both close disciples of the teachings of Jesus and the ways of Jesus, on this pathway to a village approximately seven miles outside of Jerusalem. They're having a conversation. They are talking about what everyone was talking about, and that was the crucifixion. These days, it seems like everyone's talking about COVID-19. Trust me, in this point in human history some 2,000 years ago, Everyone was talking about the crucifixion. Cleo and his buddy are on this walk heading to a village, we learn later, to have a meal, and a stranger joins them. This stranger, we'll find out who it is in a minute, he joins them and simply says, what are you talking about? Basically, the two guys, Cleo and his buddy, look at this stranger and go, what are we talking about? Are you the only visitor in all of Jerusalem and the surrounding regions who doesn't know about the crucifixion? You haven't heard about Jesus of Nazareth? And then these two men, we don't know who spoke, but they both agreed. It said they said this to the stranger. We had hoped that he was the one. We had hoped, no doubt these two men are Jewish, we had hoped he was who the Torah talked about. We had hoped he was going to restore Israel, overthrow Rome, be our champion, fulfill our hopes, dreams, desires, and wishes, but he's now been dead three days. Now, in Jewish tradition, to be dead three days means it's over and there will be no more crucifixion. There will be no more resurrection or possibility of resurrection. That was the tradition. What they didn't realize is that the resurrection and the life had joined them on the path and in their conversation. They said, we were hoping. They go on to explain. They don't realize the stranger is the resurrected Jesus. They don't recognize him. They go on to tell Jesus, you know, some ladies, that their disciples, they went to the tomb. They said it was empty, and we went, and we saw it was empty, but we don't really know. And, you know, we were hoping. We had hoped. And you can hear the sadness in these guys delivery, demeanor, tone. They, they look to the stranger, not knowing it's Jesus now, and they say, we, we had hoped. We dreamed. We imagined. We got excited, got our hopes up. We thought he was the one, but I guess he wasn't. 
Now think about this for a moment. This story may seem very simple to you, but it is probably fair to say that Cleo and his friend have been following Jesus maybe as long as his public ministry has existed, which is approximately three and a half years. Three and a half years, Cleo and his friend have watched or at least heard of the miracles, deliverance, and the magnanimous things that Jesus did for humanity. Right? He moved towards the marginalized, added value to women, cared for children, healed the leopard, loved the non-Jew. He did all of these radical, social, miraculous moments in three and a half years. And no doubt that had caused Cleo and his friend to believe, hope and believe that he was the one. Look at the human condition. Three days has fully discredited three and a half years. In just three days of Jesus being gone, what do these disciples say? Well, we kind of hope that he was the one. I, I guess not. Now, I can relate with those two guys. And I love Jesus. But I know what it's like to have my hope deferred. I know what it's like when you get all excited. And like I said, maybe it's the beginning of this year, you know, new year, new optimism, new passion, new desire, new dreams, new things you're going to do. And you, you get ready for 2020 and you're like, man, this is going to be the best year. And then it's been maybe the worst year of your life. How do you relate to those things you were hoping for? How do you connect with them? What do you, what do you think? Well, if you're like me, it probably goes something like, well, that didn't happen. Well, I was kind of hoping. I wrote out my, my dream for 2020. I wrote out, maybe it was decades ago. In your 20s, you, you were hoping for this. No, it's in my 30s. No, maybe my 40s. Well, maybe 50s. And maybe you're in the second half of your life going, well, maybe that's never going to happen. Well, I must have done something wrong. Things must be bad in my life right now because I don't have enough faith. And all of a sudden, Hope deferred makes us question our faith, and in some cases, makes us question God. That's why today what I want to articulate to you and explain to you is the difference between Bible faith and Bible hope. How does the Scripture define faith and hope? Faith and hope are different, but I think oftentimes we get them confused and we end up sad. What is faith and what is hope? Let me say it like this, and this is going to be oversimplified definitions for practical application and for your assistance and mine, but certainly ring true in the context of Scripture. Hope, essentially, is what you're believing for, right? It's like, I'm believing for that red Corvette, or I'm believing for a new job, or I'm believing for a spouse, or I'm believing that I'm going to be restored with my kids, or I'm believing that that friend that we're offended each other and we don't talk anymore, that we're going to forgive each other. Like, I'm hoping for that. I'm, I'm believing it. Maybe you made a list of things that you're believing for, and the turnaround, and the comeback, and the blessing, and the favor, and the grace, and you know, all these things that we hope for. Hope is what you believe. But faith is different. Faith is not just what you believe. Faith is almost exclusively, if not primarily, who you believe. Listen again, Hebrews 11, verse 1. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. Hold on a second. So faith is the actual holding on to something or someone based on what you're hoping for. This is interesting. It, it Clearly, clearly, the writer of Hebrews is telling us that faith is different than hope. Hope is true. Let me say it like this. Faith is more true. Faith is who you believe. Hope is what you believe. Now, we're going to tease this out a little bit and try to understand why sometimes we're sad and actually we can have more hope, more confidence, and more assurance even in the midst of circumstances and situations that frankly don't happen, don't work out, and leave us wanting and wondering. We can experience more consistency. This life of getting your hopes up, dash. Getting your hopes up, dash. Getting your hopes up, dash. That's how everybody lives. For those of us that are following Jesus or considering following Jesus, I have good news today. Faith is more true than hope. What do I mean by that? Well, 
Go with me to 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy in chapter 1. 2 Timothy in chapter 1 and verse, let's start with verse 11. Listen to now, Paul. He says, I was appointed a preacher, apostle, and teacher. Verse 12, which is why I suffer, which is why I suffer as I do, but I'm not ashamed. For I know whom I have believed. Now, hold on a second. This is interesting. Paul says, I actually, some, some situations and circumstances have actually been very painful and difficult because I follow Jesus. Whoa. That's something we're maybe a little unfamiliar with, with a hope-ridden, success, or I almost said sex-oriented, that too, but success-oriented culture, right? I mean, that's Sex and success, that about sums it up, right? We're, we're success, sex, sex, success. That, that, that's, that's, that's what I want. And we're obsessed with this thing, so when we don't get the American dream, we are disappointed. Paul says, I, I actually, things go bad because I follow Jesus oftentimes. Things have gotten difficult. And he says, but I'm not ashamed. I look at that word ashamed, it means, he goes, but I'm not embarrassed. Why would Paul be embarrassed that he was shipwrecked, snake-bitten, flogged, maligned, mistreated, imprisoned, publicly humiliated with nudity and nakedness of his own, stripped in front of crowds? What, what? Why would Paul say he's not embarrassed? Because what Paul is expressing is what oftentimes we feel. If my hope is deferred, then something must be wrong with my faith. Something must be wrong with, sometimes we do this, God. God, why did you let this happen? Paul says, all these difficult, painful, challenging things that I wish wouldn't happen. By the way, nobody hopes to suffer, right? Everybody hopes for success. Paul's not hoping to suffer, but Paul is saying, I do suffer. And oftentimes it's because I'm following Jesus. Yet nonetheless, I'm not embarrassed. Why? Because I know whom I believe. That's faith. Faith is who you believe. Faith is whom you believe, and hope is what you're believing for. Now, this message, ironically, is not against hope. I want to promote hope. I want you to hope more. I want you to get your hopes up. I want you to dream more. I want, you to, I want dreamers to dream. I want hopers to hope. I want wishers to wish. I, I, we, we need more hope, more dreams, more wishes. Write down the 29 things you're believing God for. Anticipate, expect. Yes, it's going to happen, but just understand, though the hope is true and it's noble, hope is fragile, faith is not. Faith is whom you believe. I've defined faith this way. Faith is divine persuasion. Faith is divine persuasion. God is divine and He persuades you. In other words, to believe in God, you need God to persuade you. And when that persuasion, and we'll talk about one of the ways God persuades us in a, little, in, in a few moments, when that persuasion happens, there's this little thing called free will, and we simply accept. Wow. And suddenly, faith is a person who has persuaded and who is holding me. Faith and hope. They're different, aren't they? They're different. Let me say it like this. Hebrews 11.1, we'll go back there for a moment. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. I'll say it like this. Faith is in the source of things hoped for. Faith is connection to the source. Hope is believing for situations. Hope can get very specific about situations. Faith is very specific about a person, and his name is Jesus. His name is Jesus. Hope says things like this in your life. Hope will tell you, particularly when it's deferred and delayed and, and, and you feel like things are not happening the way you set your goals to happen. Hope says stuff like this. Well, that didn't happen. And you can disagree with hope or you can admit hope is true. It didn't happen. I didn't get the red Corvette. You know, whatever it is that you're, I, I, it, it just didn't happen. Now, some will say you don't have enough faith. I'd like to push back on that. No. I think you've got plenty of hope. And what's going to help you endure is faith. Well, 
What is faith? Faith is in the source. Faith is about the source. Faith is about a person. Faith is in the source of what you're hoping for. Red Corvettes come from God. Well, Judah, those are from car dealers. Yeah, but it was God's idea to give the innovation for the motorized vehicle. It all comes from God. All the innovation, all the architecture, it all is ultimately God as the great artist and architect and designer of the ages. It all comes from God. My scripture says, my story says, God owns a cattle on a thousand hills. In other words, he owns endless Cadillacs on endless lots, right? I mean, he, he, he has it all. God lacks for nothing. So yeah, we can believe for cars. We can believe for arbitrary things. But what do you do when you get your faith out there and believe God for a new car or a new house or way more important, uh, a, a marriage you've been believing for, like I said, a relationship you want restored, and then it doesn't happen? What do you do? What do you do? Paul says, I'm not embarrassed when what I hope for doesn't happen because I know whom I believe. Wow. Now, that brings us back to the story I told you at the beginning of the sermon. Two guys, Cleo and his buddy, seven miles outside of Jerusalem. They get close to the village they're walking to, and the Bible says that Jesus was just going to keep going. But they begged him to stay, and I love this. They don't know it's Jesus yet, but they just know this guy's different than anybody. They beg him to stay companionship of Jesus is unlike anything else in the universe, begged him to stay. So he says, okay. He sits down for a meal. And we don't know exactly what they were talking about. But when Jesus broke the bread, obviously beckons back to a sermon we did, the, the meal you've been missing, talking about communion. When he broke the bread, immediately Cleo and his friend, his eyes are open and they see it's actually the resurrection and the life. It is Jesus. And he vanishes gone from the table, bread falls on the table, Jesus is gone. And they're like, <laughs> it's a pretty awesome story, right? And Cleo and his buddy look at each other and they say this. They said, oh my goodness. Did not our heart burn within us when he opened up the scriptures? It's interesting now. Their reflection of the moment was something on the inside was resonating and burning. It was, it, was, it was physical, it was tangible, it was spiritual, it was internal, it was, it, was, it was real. Now, that leads us to one more passage as I come to a conclusion. Esther's going to come and play the piano so that I sound incredibly spiritual, okay? Romans chapter 5 and verse 5. Same guy now who says in 2 Timothy, I know whom I believe. I'm not embarrassed when what I hope for doesn't happen. Because I know whom I believe. He's good. Look what Romans 5.5 5 says. Paul writes, Therefore, since we've been justified by faith, we have peace with God through Jesus. Through him we also have attained access by faith into his grace in which we stand. We rejoice in the, we rejoice in the hope. We rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Not only that, we rejoice in our sufferings. There it is again. Huh? Can we translate sufferings? Sufferings are hopes that don't happen. Paul got in a boat hoping to go somewhere. That boat crashed and wrecked on an island he had not hoped to go to. Stands by a bonfire with the native people of that island and he certainly didn't hope to get bitten by a snake, but that's what happened. Suffering is not what we hope for. It's the opposite. He says, we rejoice when what we hope for doesn't happen. <laughs> what? Knowing that suffering produces endurance. How about these words for COVID-19 in a global quarantine? Suffering, endurance. And endurance will develop an inner fortitude called character. Listen to this. And character produces Hope produces hope. But look at this. Comma, verse 5. Don't forget Romans 5, 5. And hope does not put us to shame. Do you know what that means? Hope does not embarrass us. Are you embarrassed? Are you like me? 
Are you, 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 got a, you, got a, you got a big mouth that's always talking, and you're telling people, I'm going to do this, and God's going to do this, it's going to be great, and God's going to bless us, and I want to start out, you know, and all of a sudden you're like, oh, man, I told everybody what I was hoping for, and none of it happened. Ever had one of those awkward Christian conversations for, for Christians listening? And you meet up with your buddy who believes God, and you sit down at the cafe. This is, you know, pre-COVID. You sit at the cafe, and they're like, what do you believe in God for? And you're like, man, I'm believing this next year I'm going to get married. And I'm believing for three kids. And then I'm believing for, then I'm believing I'm going to start this business. Then I'm, and, and, man, if I was a coffee with you, I'd be like, yes! Let's get our hope out. Let's get our dreams up. Let's do this. This is incredible. But what we haven't talked enough about is what happens when everything on your list doesn't happen. And I'll tell you what happens, because I'm very familiar. I start to wonder if my faith is broken, or if I haven't done enough, or worse. Is God mad at me? What? A and then, here's the social dynamic of a church. You run into other Christians. Hey, brother, how's that business going? Uh, what? The new business you started. Remember, God gave you that scripture, and you trusted God, and you put your savings into that new entrepreneur. Remember? Well, well, I, I had to kind of shut it down. It didn't work out. Oh, oh, man. Are you tithing? Did you pray about it? You ever had one of those combos? And you're like, yeah, yeah, I think so, yeah. And as Christians, we try to help other Christians by telling them, hey, it didn't work out because you didn't do it right. You didn't believe God. I wonder sometimes if modern Christians would pull the Apostle Paul aside and say, hey, the reason your ship wrecked and you got bit by a snake, you need to read your Bible more and pray more, Paul. And Paul would probably find that somewhat comical. Paul's like, no, my ship wrecked. I wouldn't have got wrecked in the ship if I didn't follow Jesus. There's an adversary. There's an enemy. He doesn't want me to get where I'm going. And this following Jesus stuff is it's a wild ride. And things oftentimes don't work out. But he says, I'm not embarrassed. I don't have to explain myself to other believers. My faith isn't broken. God isn't mad at me. Why? Because he understood faith. Faith is whom? He says, hope does not embarrass me. Here's why. Here's why. Please hear this. Because God's love has been poured into my heart through the spirit of Jesus who's given to me or lives in me. Now, that sounds a lot like those guys on that road walking with an unidentified Jesus. What did they say when he vanished from their table? They said, did your heart burn in you? Did your heart burn on the inside? Paul says, my hope that's deferred doesn't embarrass me because God's love's been poured out in my heart. Let me say it like this. Paul was expressing that his faith informs his hope. Let me say it this way. Paul's expressing his who informs his what. His who informs his what. So when what lets you down, who never will. That's how you say, I'm not embarrassed by what happened or what didn't happen. I know whom I believe. Right? Hope says things like, well, what happened? Faith says, Lord, you've proven yourself to me, and this is not my end. There are many of you who are thinking to yourself, this is the end. It's the end of a relationship. It's the end of a business. It's the end of an idea. It's the end of an era. It's the end of the way you... I'm telling you, it's not the end. Hasn't he, who, hasn't who proven to you that he's faithful and true? This can't be your end. Now, hope will tell you the dream is dead. The wishes are over. You can blow out all the candles you want on that birthday cake. It's not going to work. Your faith is broken. God's not real. He's not big. He's not good. 
But our faith says, no, my faith isn't in what? My faith isn't circumstantial or situational. My faith is anchored to a person. And by the way, the narrative and the fodder amongst many of us is hold on to hope, hold on to hope. No, Jesus is holding on to me. And so when I get my hopes up and it doesn't work out and 2020 turns into a quarantine rather than a new business that, that's booming, we wonder, well, what happened? Faith says he's proven himself over and over. I know this isn't the end. I know this isn't the end. Hope says, well, that didn't work. And hope is true. Hope is right. It didn't work. It didn't happen. It's pretty obvious. He's like, well, I was believing God for that business, and it didn't happen. Hope says, well, but God loves me. God's in control. That's good enough for me. I'm not embarrassed by what happened or what didn't happen. Why? Because it's love. That's how faith works. God persuades you with his love. That's why the greatest of these is love, 1 Corinthians 13 says. These three remain, faith, hope, and love. Oh, we need hope. I'm not against hope. Hope is true. Faith is just more true. And God will persuade you by pouring into your hearts his unconditional, unrelenting love by his spirit. In fact, that's what's happening right now. That's what's happening right now. This is not merely the exchange of ideas and concepts. This is an encounter. And the same God who caused Cleo and his friend's heart to burn within him is the same Jesus to pour his love into your heart right now and persuade you again that it is who you believe, not what. See, faith, faith allows God to take hold of you. And you know where God lives? It's in this place called forever. It's in this place called eternity. Wouldn't it be silly for time to inform eternity? I don't know, my brothers and sisters, forever informs the finite. And that's where God lives. Faith connects to the one who fills forever. And so these temporary, light, momentary afflictions are going to fade and they're going to give way to a far exceeding weight of glory. And that's a person. And his name is Jesus. I remember getting my hopes up from my dad God extended his life miraculously, the first pastor of this community when it was called City Church, and God extended his life some six years. Some doctors thought he wouldn't live more than six months. Boy, we got our hopes up. We believed God. Some would say it was faith. A lot of it, yeah, but it was hope. It was circumstantial. It was literal. It was like, God, you got to heal him of cancer. And it was incredible. But dad's gone. He died from multiple myeloma. That's the truth. He died from cancer. So what do I do now? Am I embarrassed because our prayers didn't work? Are we kind of humiliated because he didn't get healed? And healing, isn't that what Jesus does? So didn't we? If what we were believing for didn't happen... Maybe something's wrong. Nothing's wrong. It's called the finite. It's called the here and the now. And there will be pain and there will be loss. But we know whom we believe and we know where he is. He is in a place called eternity. He is forever. He is the resurrection and the life. And I will see my dad again in a place that never ends. This, this will end. Eternity, new heaven and new earth will never end. And I will be there with Jesus, whom I believe. And I'll be there with my dad and all those who have gone on before. I think this is why we might be sad. Because we confuse faith and hope. And we believe the, the what we're believing for. If it doesn't happen, something's wrong. No, I mean, a lot of things are wrong. But oftentimes our hope is deferred in this 
broken, finite place called earth. But faith, he is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He changes not. He is true. Everything about him is right. And faith is a trust in the God-man, Jesus Christ. And that's what happened in Luke 24. Those two young guys had no idea that their hope was about to collide with faith. Their hope was colliding with a person. Let me tell you what the resurrection did. The resurrection changed hope forever in this universe called Earth. In this universe with the stars and the solar system and the galaxies, it's forever. All the dreams, all the wishes, all the desires, all the aspirations, expectations of all people everywhere have been changed forever. And now hope has now found a far greater collaborator, faith. It's based on a person whose name is Jesus. I wish I could tell you if you had enough faith, everything you hoped for would come true. Sometimes we're almost led to believe that. That's just not the case. There will be more things we will hope for, and they will not happen. And then there'll be things we didn't hope for, and they'll happen. How about that? Lord, I never asked for this. I never prayed. He can do exceedingly abundantly above all you ask, think, or imagine. Hang out with a few Christians, Jesus followers who've been doing it for a while. They'll tell you, God is so good. He's not giving me what I hope for by his grace sometimes. That's what I want. God's like, nah, I think what you really want, what you really need. He's just so faithful. He's so faithful. I'm just believing for a steadiness. I'm believing for a consistency. That your emotions will not be informed by what happened or didn't happen, but your emotions will be informed by whom is holding on to you. And his name is Jesus. God, I thank you for these minutes and moments that we share. and Just love you. It's extraordinary. You've given us all things pertaining to life and godliness. We thank you for that. You're here today, wherever you are in the world, watching by yourself, family members, roommate, friend, in a park, in a living room, in a bedroom. You're watching right now, and you would like to receive the free gift of forgiveness. You would like to respond to the divine persuasion of Jesus and just accept you can't earn or deserve forgiveness the Bible says Jesus became sin he knew no sin he committed no sin he became sin so that you and I by simply believing in what he did not what we did but what he did we can have a relationship with God that will not end ever we will spend forever with Jesus how just receive when I say, if you'd like to believe in Jesus, what I'm saying is, would you like to receive Jesus? If you'd like to do that, wherever you are in the world, on the count of three, I'm going to ask you to raise your hand. I know it seems a little awkward, but I believe when you respond on the outside to what's happening on the inside, it just makes it more real to you. One, two, three. If that's you, slip up, just slip up your hand. God, you see these hands. You see these souls and these hearts. And we thank you so much so much that forgiveness flows freely. Now, I pray for every person who's made this decision and I pray for the entire community of church home around the world. We declare at church home, our faith will inform our hope. We know whom we have believed and you are the true riches and we thank you for that relationship that is secure and cannot be broken and goes on forever and ever without end. In Jesus' name, amen. Love you, church. Amen. That was, I'll give it you, babe. It was better than great. You were right. I was wrong. <laughs> I stand corrected. Hey, just want to take a moment, as I mentioned here, because we aren't just a content delivery system through whatever way you're watching this. We're actually building a real community, which is the church. And I just want to let you know a few things about 
being a part of the community. First of all, if you raised your hand, or maybe like a finger, or maybe you didn't quite raise your hand, but something on the inside of you at the end when Judah said, if you would like to receive Jesus, if that was you and there's something, as Judah mentioned, burning in your heart and you said, yes, Jesus, I want to know you more. We would love to help you in your next steps with Jesus. You know, a relationship with Jesus is an incredible lifelong journey. And we would be so honored as a church community to help you take that next step with Jesus. And so how we would like to help you to do that is right now we have pastors who are on our pastor chat feature either at churchhome.org or on the free Church Home app. You can go on there and there's pastors right now who are, I always feel like such an infomercial, standing by right now to talk to you. And maybe you don't even know what to say to them. All you have to say is, I, I, I want to know more of Jesus. And they can lead you in the conversation. And don't worry, this isn't priest. You don't have to confess all of your sins. It's not confessional. It is honestly just leading you into a relationship with Jesus. As well as if you're watching this and maybe you've known Jesus for some time, but you feel isolated or alone or you need prayer for anything, can I encourage you? to join us at Pastor Chat as well. And let us stand with you. Let us pray with you. You are not alone. It's so amazing the conversations that happen hour after hour, day after day at Church Home on Pastor Chat. It's really been incredible to see a lot of people have real conversations and get real help and hope and wisdom and prayer. And so whatever we can do to serve you, we would love to do that along with you. The other thing we do here in these last moments as a community is always talk a take a moment to talk about our finances and our giving. The truth is the reason we're able to do any of this is because of free will, generous giving for people who are part of Church Home who say, yes, I, I want to give. And if that's you and you would love to give with what's happening here, you can text the word generosity to 97,000. That's 97,000, the word generosity. You can just go ahead and text us and then the prompts will be there. But just so you know, there's never any pressure. There's no obligation. You don't have to give here because we say you have to belong or giving doesn't make God love you anymore. The truth is he already loves us so much. And so I've been thinking today, what causes people to give? It's so amazing, the free will gift of giving that takes place. And I read this verse in 2 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 9. I want to share it with you. It says this, just as the scriptures say about the one who trusts in him or about the one who trusts in Jesus, it says this, because he has sown extravagantly and given to the poor, his kindness and his generous deeds will not be forgiven. There it is, that people who are, are, are extravagant givers and give to people in need. What is the motivation that it says here in 2 Corinthians 9? It is because we trust in God. And man, I don't know about you, but with so much pressure hitting our finances these days, looking at what's happening in our economy and so much uncertainty, it can it's so our human nature just to say, oh, I don't know what's happening, so I need to hoard as much as I can. But it's been so incredible for me to be a part of a community, watching people continue to give, and even watching so many people give beyond what they would normally give, realizing that there are people who do have needs and that we can help meet people's needs in this moment. And I've been wondering what inspires such an incredible community of people to give the way that Church Home gives. And it's simply this, because we trust in God. We don't trust in an economy. We don't trust in ourselves. We put our trust in God. And because of that, listen to what it says. It says that we give extravagantly and we give to the poor. And listen to what it says God does for those who give that way. It says his kindness, our kindness, and our generous deeds will never be forgotten. You know, God loves it when he sees that you are a giver, not because he loves you anymore, but because he sees himself in you. My whole goal for my whole life is to look more and more and more like Jesus. I wanna be more of a wife who looks like Jesus and a mom who looks like Jesus. But one of the most practical ways we can look like Jesus is by being a giver, because Jesus is the ultimate giver who gave his life for us. So once again, Church Home, thank you for your giving. It's so special and meaningful and significant in these times. And if you want to participate along with us, you can just text the word generosity to 97,000 and you can join us. We love you so much. Now let's enjoy these moments together of singing and letting this message go from our head right into our heart. What a beautiful name it is. What a beautiful name. A beautiful name it is, and I 